a little, just a brief bit of background as to where I came from and how I ended up in design. I studied uh, furniture design or woodwork really strictly in, um, in Canberra at the ANU. And then I moved to uh, Holland. I sort of decided that I didn't want to be a, just a, a, fine, a fine furniture maker. I actually wanted to research and, and understand the conceptual side of design and, and product design. So I moved and did a master's in, in Design Academy in Eindhoven, which is this experimental school um, very much focused around this Dutch notion of being uh, research driven and trying to find new, new pathways to, to projects and resolutions. And that's informed a lot of my work now. So um, it's kind of taken, I still am grounded in the making and I, whilst I don't do a lot of it myself anymore, um, it still informs a large part. I feel like uh, that part of my, my, pro my process will never leave and I'm always um, very much in tune with materials. Uh, but it has definitely sort of focused now on more of a research role and my studio reflects that. Um, so this, this was going to be a talk about inspiration. Um, and not this kind of inspiration. Um, inspiration has been hijacked, I feel, by mass media. It's kind of this, it's this dirty word and I thought, well, what is inspiration to me? Is it, is it, is it something that, uh, you know, I look at and, and feel a connection to or is it, actually simplicity that I'm, that I'm inspired by. And this is what we see now as, <laughs> as simplicity. And this is, this is also something I'm not exactly in tune with. So really you find, you find then that simplicity has been hijacked by media as well and, and marketing and it's become a spin term in its own sense. So I, I sort of tried to figure out what, what is simplicity to me? What does it mean to me in design? And what does it mean to me in, 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 my, in my practice? And I know that a lot of people feel simplicity differently. They might find it in, in a dinner or in food or something like that. But the categories that I feel represent simplicity are sensitivity, community, low tech, form, and the human. And I've sort of categorized those in this talk. And I'm going to talk a bit about each of those components and how they relate to my idea of simplicity. Um, the first is, this is, this is how I feel sensitivity could be reflected in design. This is a, um, this is a tree in a uh, Canadian um, uh, natural park where, you know, a sort of um, botanic garden. And it's labelled and obviously they've created this sort of spring-loaded mechanism so that the nails in the tree that hold the plate on there and the tree can move behind it and aren't overtly affected by this, by this idea of this pla plaque being on the tree. And in a way, this sort of embodies how, in design, we have to consider what our impact is on um, the things that we do when we, if, we, if we're applying design to them or the people who are interacting with them, in this case, nature. Um, the next one is community. This is something that I always think is actually a hard thing to design for, but it's something that is it's in everything that we do. And, um, it's, fine, it's hard to find a sort of an image for this context, but this, uh, this is a communal street sweeping uh, station, I suppose, that, was, that I found when I was traveling in Spain. And it, what I loved about this is that it sort of illustrates that the actions that, that you make as a designer or in a community, they're gonna have some additional knock-on to, um, to the people around. So they, they simply added this kind of dustpan and room, and it suggests a sense of pride in that courtyard and in that public space which I think really embodies that sense of community that a design gesture can make. Another one that um, sort of relates to community as well is this, this is some parking lines that have been, uh, that I found in the US that have been extended up onto a, uh, up onto the wall in front. I've never seen this before, but it's just, again, a simple gesture that can make a user more mindful of their surroundings and how they park might impact someone else. So an another, idea of how, of how community plays into this. Now, the next thing is um, low-tech, which I mentioned before. And these systems, these low-tech systems, often reveal a sort of open mechanical or an open conceptual understanding of how they work. Um, I think the goal of any industrial designer should be to give the user a really connected feeling um, to a product or a project. Uh, and I think this is done by understanding the process 
behind the design decisions. You know, if you, if you as a user can understand those, those decisions, then you can identify with the product or the project. Uh, it doesn't have to be the kind of big slap in the forehead idea that reveals itself, you know, as soon as you see it. It can be something that over time, living with a product, you begin to understand why it's come about. And a little bit of the designer is embodied in the product. So I'll run through these, these three as, as, as a kind of, uh, as, as, an, as an illustration of, of what I'm talking about. So in the mind of pre-tech, pre-tech, the idea here, or, or, or low-tech, is that technology has, has moved us so far forward that we begin to lose track of what uh, are the systems in place happening behind the mechanisms of the technology. So the scale on the left-hand side is, uh, was photographed in a flea market in Holland. And this is a, this is a bit of a turning point for, for body image and home diagnosis. Because if you know, it actually reads and looks like uh, a scale that you might find in a kitchen. But the scale mechanism is directly related to the uh, transfer of the post that when you tread on the scale, pushes down and then you get a readout on the dial. Now, you can't obviously read that yourself. So you would stand in a doctor's office and you would get weighed and they would take note of your weight and then they would prescribe you whatever kind of bizarre Dutch treatment you would get, uh, which probably involves some sauerkraut. And you would then go home and, and you would probably not take any more notice of that. But now you can see here that the technology and the user interface is caught up, so there's this mirror that falls down. And that mirror now allows you to see the front of the dial yourself. So suddenly you're seeing this, pro this product sort of start to morph from something that was only in a, in a doctor's surgery to becoming something that you could have at home. And I find this, this moment of transfer of technology really interesting. Um, the next one is, uh, this is a filing cabinet or a secure filing cabinet that comes from a Bendigo post office, which closed down. And it's, it's, a, it's a simple gesture in security. Now we have dual passcodes or double signed accounts so people can access certain, certain things together. You can't get at something or a file or a document with just one person. Um, now a more low tech version of this, as you can see here, is a, uh, it's a filing cabinet that has these two leaves at the front and you both need two keys to access this thing. So you, once one side's closed, you can't actually open the drawers. The other side, you know, you need, you need both these items. And this is something that now we, we is so hidden behind a veil of technology that we wouldn't understand the kind of simplicity that is embodied in an actual physical object like that. Um, the next one is the ear horn, or uh, I mean, I, I don't even have to explain what that is because I think you all understand what it is. And in, in the time now where technology has zoomed, moved so far ahead in, in, uh, in biology and, and, and medical devices, no, no, I don't think, uh, you know, 1% of the population understand how um, a, a bionic ear works. But you can immediately understand this. And it's not that everyone should go back to this, I'm certainly not suggesting that. But there was, in this pre-tech, low-tech age, there was a certain simplicity in objects that we have now really moved on from. And, uh, and I think we've lost that human connection with something because we don't quite understand how they work. Now, the next slide, this, this is a category that I find really uh, I find really important. It's something I really am excited by and I think it's the sort of holy grail of, of industrial design and that is form and how to, resolve, how to resolve a problem using form and material alone. And when I say material, one material. I mean, if you can resolve a problem with one material and form, then you've nailed it really. It's, it's, it's actually uh, quite an accomplishment. So to explain these two things, you might, you might obviously understand what they are, but the one on the left is a, uh, is a stock separator. So by using the standard, the, the, the obvious um, physics of, of oil rising above water uh, and the chemist, basic chemistry of that, you, you can understand that when you pour from the bottom of the spout, you're only pouring the good liquid off, the, the fats reserved at the top. Um, so simple placement of spout and understanding of, of, the, of the sciences there and using glass in its most elegant form, I think, to create something that's utilitarian but also incredibly functional, uh, in incredibly beautiful, sorry. So contrast that to this toilet roll holder, which we've probably all seen toilet rolls holders and use them every day. So it's something that you wouldn't think deserved a redesign. And this is not, not something that has been redesigned. This is an old piece that both these pieces are, are designer unknown. So 
Um, and that's sort of a lot how my collection evolves of these kind of images. Again, suitability material, ceramic. Uh, and the ceramic is glazed in such a way and the form is created in such a way to be soft and it almost sort of uh, cradles the, the toilet roll so it doesn't need an axle through the middle. You can simply, the friction uh, resist it against the, the paper and the porcelain creates um, a perfect uh, escape for the paper and, and, and use for the roll. So again, you know, form material coming together to create something that's um, quite uh, harmonising. Um, the next thing is you know, this idea of resolving form is something that, that often requires feedback from users and this is something that I've always also found really uh, exciting is this idea that you know, as someone uses a product and gains more and more or, or an object and gains more and more um, understanding of it, they start to implement their own changes in these things. So on the left here, you've got a window cleaner's ladder. This was photographed in London, um, in the Spitalfield markets. And I was drawn to it because obviously it's an unusual form. But then I started talking to the guy who was using the ladder and he said, oh yeah, 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 we do these ladders because you know, they're really hard to come by. But when you're moving across a glass fronted building, you only leave one smudge mark. So as you're cleaning, you don't have to clean too off. Um, which I thought was genius. I mean, it would take a window cleaner two years and years to uh, you know, design for this kind of problem. Um, the next one is, uh, this is for picking up acorns. And this is, this is a product that I've always loved because it's again, it's a simple material. It's a very basic material that when bent and formed in, in a correct sort of, and held in a correct position, uh, you know, with just the rolling force, the acorns slip inside and the smaller bark and things fall away so you can collect all the things on the ground. So the next category is, uh, is the human aspect. Um, and the human one is, is also important because this is where the user begins to alter their surroundings and you see this kind of, uh, you know, um, invention is the kind of mother of a need or something like that. So you have this sort of people tr going out and, and changing their circumstances using found objects or things that they've had got around them to, to better their, pl their place. Uh, this was shot at the Architecture Bernali in uh, Venice. And as you can see, this is a, a very cold, he's actually Japanese, this guy is in the Japanese pavilion. Um, and the, I don't know who, who invented this idea, but it's obviously kind of melting the chair. And he's lined the slots up on the, on the radiator to kind of feed through into the back of the chair. And I thought, you know, that's probably, with a bit of work, could be, could be quite a handy invention. Um, so this is this kind of, this is this inter intersection where design hacking and, it, and, it, and things start to, you know, you really get a, a notion that you can start prototyping things and prototyping ideas out of this sort of user interface, user interaction. So in the spirit of this DIY, you see that there's a, um, obviously on the right here, you can see uh, boat fenders on the back of a car. This is in Paris, a notoriously uh, dodgy parking city where people are known and openly comment about their parking style being just reversed back until you hear a bit of a crunching sound and then you know you can't go any further. So, you know, as, as you can see, like a bit tongue in cheek, but still someone obviously adapting what they need for their, for their purpose there, uh, what they could find for their purpose. So, and on the left, this is, um, this is actually a, a, quite a poignant piece because I don't know how, how many of you have walked into a building and not knowing what to do, whether you push the door or pull the door or stand there and wave at the door or, you know, there's, there's so little, um, there's so little information now and we've been lied to so many times that we, we often don't know how to interact with, with our spaces and products and things like that uh, and, and the built environment really. So this, this item is, uh, is, is, is reference to a Don Norman who wrote about um, everyday design and he said that you know if you ever have anyone who's who's ambiguous about what to do with the door if you hang a rope from it they'll never push on a rope if you see a rope you'll pull a rope so this idea that you know this glass door has been the handles have been taken off and someone's put a rope on it is um is immediately spoke to me from his writing and i think it makes for actually a really clear observation uh you know with the right materials and the right process you can actually create a very clear 
uh, design outcome. So, all right, that sort of leads me now to my, to my own process. It's been a bit of a, you know, to try and sum up what you do and, and how you work is tricky because it's always changing. And I think that that's part of designing is that you have to be open to this idea of change. And some, something that has continually popped up is this idea of, for me, is called gleaning potential. So where you see something like these images before and you notice that there's a potential there that you want to draw on and evolve and change. And this, this, how this idea can be developed, what interests me is how this idea can be developed from one thing and then turn into another thing and then ultimately become something quite different. So gleaning potential starts for me with this, um, with this torch, which many of you probably know and maybe a few have owned before. Um, this is, these observations of mine and, and often this, and this torch is one of them is something that I've picked up uh, and had in the drawer for ages and started thinking about, you know, if we take camping equipment as an example uh, to how we live today, you know, we, we sort of live in apartments that are like big tents, they have one big room. And these apartments have kind of, they've almost become Swiss army knives. You know, the dining table creates, has to turn into, a, into an office sometimes, or, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the couch has to become uh, a bed or, you know, there's, there's all this multifunctionality that keeps happening in the home. And what I, what I saw from this, and this is just a, an, in, an internal project that we've been uh, processing and, and trying to think about is, you know, what happens when you take something like a camping lantern and you adapt the technology to a found object? So in this case, this is a 3D printed sleeve that goes inside an industrial pendant light, but it's the same technology and the same idea behind um, a sliding camping lantern. So you know, you have this uh, adjustable light, light that you can either have as a focus down light or slide open to create uh, an ambient uh, lantern. Um, sometimes the potential, this sort of gleaning potential is revealed from the product itself. Um, in this case, the angle poise lamp, which has been made in this format for 50 plus years. It's, it's been enduring, a design icon. Um, the original designer, Herman Terry, could never have conceived in his time uh, the advent of LED uh, lighting sources. Um, yet the light is still produced today, unchanged, bar for some heavy, heavy grade springs here, um, because now it has to, the drooping head requires heavier springs to hold up the, um, the energy efficient bulbs that are now required to go into this lamp. So starting as that as a starting, at a starting point, um, we designed this lamp, which is a nine, it's probably 40 years old, this light. And um, we introduced this glass shade, which is exactly a replica of the, uh, of the previous tin shade. Except um, we've suggested the technology advancement and you actually no longer need a shade. The focused, um, the focused LED light gives you the spot desk that you need on, on your desk. And uh, the addition of the glass and the, and the LED um, were designed to be exactly the same weight as the original shade with a filament bulb. So in fact, this little section could be retrofitted to any lamp of any period. Um, or you see another intervention in the, in the case of the uh, Le Creuset stock pot. Uh, a sort of a classic, undoubtedly a lot of you probably own one of these, but uh, we thought about a way, how, how could you suddenly update, update a product that's had such an enduring legacy? And, 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 our, and our thoughts were that you could put this trivet on the lid so you could use the lid upside down and put the pot on it. Um, in the case of the very ubiquitous Tolix chair that you see everywhere now, um, this was really, in, when it was designed by Xavier Pouchard, it was really designed in the 30s. It was designed for, for short uh, factory workers' lunches. And they really, they were wearing you know, heavy denim and they would have sat down for 15 minutes and had a sandwich and a cigarette in the dockyards of Paris and, and then be off uh, back at work. Um, and it's now found its way into the homes of people everywhere. And it's become this kind of design icon because it's very long lasting, incredibly durably, durable. Uh, galvanized metal lasts very well in Australia because of its um, rust resistance. But we wanted to think about how, how 
an, alter, an alteration and, and, and changing how it could be perceived and how it could be warmed up for modern living. So this is a vegetable tan leather kind of slip cover that slides over the top of the, of the existing. It doesn't change uh, how any, any of the architecture of the chair, everything remains unchanged, but it, it forms a kind of almost a club chair out of, a, out of what was a, a previously a steel garden chair. Um, so the next object is probably my most commercially successful example of, of gleaning potential. Um, the object on the left is, uh, is a sawhorse bracket that I found when I was traveling in the, in the States. Um, it's very plasticky, as you can see there. It's made entirely of injected ABS, and it barely worked. It was, it was, I ordered a couple and I thought, this will be great, what I'll do with this is I'll make a table. It'll be really good because I can use this thing and it goes with my system of taking something from somewhere else and making something else. And, and as I began to play with it, I realized that, you know, it just was wobbly and, it, and, and way under-engineered and, the, and they'd taken all these shortcuts in trying to produce an object that was cheap for the backyard shed. But actually there was a kernel of an idea in there which was far, far greater. And uh, on the right you can see the very first uh, A-joint sand cast in Sydney in 2010. And it's, um, it's made from solid bronze and the, the table is ash. And that took a lot of time to engineer this, this new piece out existing, from an existing concept. We, take, we took it and we uh, cast it in bronze but also changed the angles and changed the support angles. And this same component now, this, this same bronze component in aluminium or bronze, doesn't matter, can support a ton of marble, um, timber, plywood, very flexible in terms of how it can be used, with minimum architecture. So actually is one of the su strongest support frames for any desk. And it can be disassembled and repurposed. And I imagine hopefully one day we'll end up in a couple of backyards serving as sawhorses. So I feel like this is something that has gone from a complete uh, transformation, but started with something that was already in industry, but being underutilized. Now we haven't just sort of, this gives you a bit of a breakdown as to how an A-joint table works. You can see the body casting and the cast wedge. Um, some simple timber joinery hold the underframe of the table. Legs slot in, tabletop goes down, screws go on to hold the top down, and the rest is basically two bolts that hold everything together. So we didn't stop there, we thought, we thought this is really great. You can actually do quite a lot with just this component. It spawned a whole range of parts and pieces. And, from round tables to a little miniature version for, for benches. And then the, the latest one was the, um, was the A-joint stretch, uh, which is, I think, pushed it to its, its furthest capacity and, and something that we needed to do the original A-joint to get to this point, because this is now enabling workstations that are three metres long and 1,500 metres wide that, that require no more than three, three components to put together. And that's really unheard of in, in that kind of desking situation that you can have such strength and such, such spans with, with, with such little architecture. And I think what the most, most valuable thing to me now is that as, and, and Vince kind of touched on this a little bit, is that people now rec recognize the table as, as, a, as a unit. They don't think about the joint. And the joint, and that's exactly as it should be. The joint should just be there doing its job quietly. Well, the table supports the life and what you do, and, and, and the architecture beneath it is, is virtually invisible. So, you probably never see these two slides together um, again. And I did that just because it's sort of, to me, this brings in another facet of our work, which is um, interiors as well. So, I, I approached the idea of design, designing, whether it be product, furniture, um, system or uh, interior with the same idea. You know, it's analysis of what's out there and, and, it's, and it's trying to work out a way to use something that, that's existing often um, or an idea that's, you know, we've, we've kind of had in, in the pipelines for a while. And what struck me with Aesop is Aesop is actually utility branded at, at heart. And albeit a, it's a very refined utility brand, but really the apothecary bottles and that simple you know, use of the brass kit, but garden taps and you know, all the design language comes from a found bottle. These bottles were found, all these jars and all these items were found. They were, they were, a graphic treatment was applied to them, obviously, but they were 
really, uh, they came from the medical industry and the, utility and, the, and the pharmaceutical industry. So we wanted to hinge off that and think, well, what else? Could we do the interior in the same way? Could we basically apply a graphic treatment to the, um, the interior of, of, of a store? So we set ourselves the challenge, um, sort of egged on by Dennis at, at, uh, at ESOP, who's the founder and creative director. He, um, he pushed us forward. We said, well, we, want to, we want to design your store from Bunnings. We don't want to go to any other stores. And he was like, oh, yeah, I love Bunnings. Do it. So we started, um, we started playing around. And we actually couldn't find everything we needed from Bunnings. But we did go, we did scour for, for good quality um, uh, fittings and fixtures that really were based in utility. So this is the uh, a cool room shelving, which, um, which we repurposed to hold the sinks, uh, shelving for product, point of sale, filing cabinets. Um, you can see it's the same, it's the same component. We, we, we mixed up a, a custom powder coat color that we spent probably a month trying to figure out what you know, suited the uh, the labelling and corresponded with the sandstone in the space, and everything went in loose. So all the plumbing and all the the, the, the sinks and the uh, and the point of sale um, were all loose items, so that they could stand off this incredible shell that we had. Uh, a piece of sandstone slab was put on top of the um, a smooth sandstone slab was on top of the pods to reference the walls and contrast against them. Um, so the next image here, this leads on to another ESOP collaboration. Um, and this one is inspired by the work of Donald Judd. Um, Judd's always been, I've always been intrigued by his work because it's got such a, it's got such simple forms, but there's also a huge complexity in the, in just in, in how deformed they can be from being so pure. So, you know, this is a brass, it's a living material, it will smudge, it will, it will, it will change in time. And you can even see how it's deformed the floorboards here, but yet it still mirrors it. So we thought, you know, how could we translate something so austere, yet give it a sort of human feel? Um, and this is uh, the resulting work for ESOP, which was in Crow's Nest. Uh, and that opened late last year. And we designed these sort of monolithic forms in the, in the shape of the pause point of sale and the rear storage wall. And uh, we contrasted that with this sort of dense patina and oil timber and a, and a really domestic furniture setting. So the space had quite a, um, a homey feel to it, yet still could carry that sort of cleanliness of the, of the monolithic shapes. Um, now this sort of kind of wraps me up. I, I'm, in, in a way, I'm so I'm interested more and more by larger forms, architecture, and interiors, and mainly because I think they have the most profound effect on people. Um, a very small object has a profound effect on people, and then you know the space has a, has a, has a tends to have a, a profound effect on people. So I'm trying to work with these two ends and, and trying to find projects that are that are small and also um, projects that encapsulate the kind of larger. Larger, larger spaces. Um, this led to an investigation into the details of the larger spaces. So uh, this is a bit of a traveler's mecca. This is the, the Thorne Abbey in the south of France. And when I visited this space, I was just, as many architects are, I think, or designers are, that they're blown away by these, by this repetition of archways and the, and the detailing and, and, the, and the way the space makes you feel. It's, it's sort of cool inside, um, yet, has a density and a, and a rhythm to it, which is, uh, it's, it's like nothing else. Um, so I wanted to create a range of objects that um, drew upon architectural elements that I'd been drawn to uh, at, in my travels. And this is the beginning of that um, sort of process. So this is the Thorne dish. This is less like, a, it's about this big and it can be stood up or laid flat or you can use it as a, anything you like. It's not really about its use, it's about its investigation for me in, into these kind of components and seeing if we can bring a little bit of this larger form into a, into a condensed um, shape and something you can live with. Uh, and that brings me to the end.